Welcome, everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome to the Institute of Race Relations at 50 panel, New Circuits of Anti-Racism. Thank you to TWT for hosting. It's amazing to see how the conversation around race has developed since TWT started. In the opening years, race was very much relegated to a kind of secondary phenomenon that uh, attendees would talk about. And now I've already seen such rich conversations happening, not only on panels, but between people. So I'd like to congratulate TWT on making that change. I'm Kay Biswas, I'm a writer and critic. I'm the director of Resonance FM and the editor of Representology, which is the journal for media and diversity. 2022 marks 50 years since the Institute of Race Relations underwent a radical transformation steered by the late A. Sivanandan, uh, the Sri Lankan born thinker who passed away in 2018. Over the past half century, the IRR and its wonderful journal Race and Class have been at the forefront of the public conversation around race in Britain. Not only in terms of analysing structural and institutional racism, but also formulating practical ways of resistance. So I am delighted to be joined by a wonderful panel. Next to me, I have Liz Fiquette, the director of the Institute of Race Relations and author of Europe's Fault Lines, Racism and the Rise of the Right, which is out on Versa. Sophia Siddiqui, the deputy editor of the journal Race and Class and coordinator of IRR News. Avsar Shafi, an editor at Ebb magazine and co-author of Race to the Bottom, Reclaiming Anti-Racism and Chantelle Lewis, the host of the podcast Surviving Society and the Deputy Director of Leading Roots. So Liz, can I start with you? Could you give us an overview of the nodes of anti-racism, not only in Britain, but in a wider global context? Uh, thank you very much, Biz. Um, I just wanted to say, to start with, uh, the IRR is 50 years old, but I haven't been there half a century. Um, but I have been there 40 years. And when I was preparing for this panel, one of the things that struck me is that everything that we were seeing in the 1980s in terms of the level of organisation that we had in the 1980s, with police monitoring groups all around the country, with anti-immigration uh, organizations fighting to support people. Everything is coming back, but this time it's gonna come back bigger and better and stronger. I'm really confident of that. And the other thing, just to answer, before I answer Biz's question, I don't know how many of you were in the last forum. I know Chantel was, because she was on the platform for that one, and she's very tired because she's got to do two in a row. <laughs> but if you were at the last, um, session when we were talking about police in schools and we were talking about abolitionism being an imaginative project to imagine a future where the police weren't there where social problems were dealt with as social problems and that we could imagine a world where law and order and policing weren't the solutions to uh, social problems and I just wanted to say in relation to that but it's not so hard to imagine a future without police in schools. Because when I was a young activist in Hackney in 1981, we were campaigning to stop the police coming into schools. And there were no police in schools at that time. And the NUT and everyone were behind us at that point. So we don't have to imagine a future, we can also imagine a time in the past. Nodes of anti-racism. I think one thing that is clear, that anti-racism has to be based on a political culture of solidarity, where people come together to fight common problems in an organised way. Now, Asfar and Ilias have written a brilliant book that looks at the whole ways that in the 1990s and the early 2000s, that culture of solidarity, that political culture we had in the 1980s were bro was broken down. Thatcher was very good at that, 
but there were other things too. There was a sense of, I think, too much individualism entered our movements as well. Perhaps that's sort of social media. I oh, know I'm old, so you know what. <laughs> but any, yeah, yeah, okay. Chantel will let me have that one. Anyway, I won't go into our posterity because he will speak about it more. But I think we've also had such clear examples, and we're not here to talk about the Labour Party today. This session isn't to talk about the Labour Party, but we've seen all the political parties instrumentalise anti-racism for their own purposes and actually deliberately play to communal voting. And that has been a real problem for us in these wilderness years. But as I said, those people were never interested in transforming the world. At best, they would give you management strategies around diversity and representation. But the kind of transformative, anti-racist, anti-imperialist politics that did pertain in the 1990s is coming back, as I've said. And within that, when we're talking about nodes, abolitionism is clearly a crucial node in the new circuits of anti-racism. It's the way we all recognise a fellow a traveller in the fight against racism and penal populism. Because as I said, it's the whole penal populism, the way that people... Oh, we're not talking about the Labour Party. Well, let's say the, <laughs> the leaders of certain parties act as though they were a cop and a prosecutor and not the leader of a party bringing transformative change. So it's the way we recognise a fa fellow traveller. And one thing that has struck me since the Child Q case and also the Chris Carbu case is how our campaigns are now becoming national campaigns. Sivan Anderson used to say we have to turn uh, cases into issues, issues into causes, causes into national ca campaigns. And that is what we're happening today. Jengba was always a national campaign. From the moment Jengba started, those women who started Jengba were always a national campaign. So policing prisoner, prisons, criminal justice are all key at nodes. But there is a, another vital node in anti-racism that has been obscured in the, what I would call the wilderness years. And that is racism is always about exploitation. And the race class fight of migrant and low paid workers is another key node with the networks forming around immigration injustice also linked to abolitionism, opposing immigration raids and forming a protective ring around communities. That's why in our anti-racism, we do need to unite with trades unions, which place themselves on the side of migrant workers. But we also need to criticize other trade unions that have not come to first base in recognising the dangers of working class nativism. Racism is always about the violence of the state, so state racism is another critical node for us to fight around. So refugees fleeing di occupation, dictatorship and today's race war resource wars are at the front line of resistance. And I think what we're seeing at European borders today is a visceral demonstration of a civilizational racism of Europe. When we're seeing, as our colleagues in Poland say, who work at both the border with Ukraine and the border with Belarus, it's like there are two different countries in one, two totally different set of rules, people whose lives are worth saving and those who can die in the forest. So radical anti-racism has always been linked to internationalism. It's always had international struggles at its core against fascism, against colonialism, against imperialism. Recall the struggles around Vietnam and South Africa, but also Algeria, Chile, Bolivia, Grenada, Palestine, Mozambique, Angola, Zimbabwe, and the great thinkers who emerged out of that struggle, some of which at race and class we've been privileged to work with, Sivan Anden, of course. Um, Walter Rodney, Cedric Robinson, Angela Davis, names that spring to mind. At our IR50 conference at King's on October the 15th, which you hope we'll be able to come to, we are trying to get it live streamed as well. I'm not quite sure where we're at, 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 on, on, on that at the moment. We're going to have a, a session on radical internationalism and global shifts in the world order. 
exploring the new fascisms and the interlocking na nature of nationalism and imperialism. But in lines with the tradition of race and class, we are not going to do this in a Eurocentric, Atlantis way that I fear that much of the left follows. We are not going to disappear the global south from the discussion around imperialism. You don't fight one imperialism with another form of imperialism. Only supporting all the, by supporting all the people of the world who have experienced invasion, who are living under occupation, only then can we part, be part of a tradition of radical internationalism. And that, in an earlier period, drew inspiration from a non-aligned movement of countries, some of which we might consider being reflected by the African Union's recent statement at the UN that Africa has suffered enough of the burden of history and does not want to be the breeding ground for a, a new Cold War. Just to conclude, today I see the growth of new organisational structures as kind of justice oases in the arid desert of structural violence and injustice. It's wonderful to be my age, not bit over a century, quite a bit over... Oh, no, God, what did I say? bit over <laughs> half a century. Where's my walking stick and simmer frame? Uh, it's wonderful to be my age, to have lived through one era of struggle, to have survived so many years in the desert and feel hope coming back. I'm very privileged to be able to discuss these things with these wonderful young activists and researchers here who are now providing the words and tools for us to go forward. And that's why sharing my discussions with them, spending time with them, makes me confident that this time we will do it better because we are connecting bigger. We are connecting across struggles, particularly around issues to do with white supremacy, patriarchy, LBT, LGBTQ rights, particularly transgender rights. All of this makes it essential that we develop a political culture that respects our differences while building unity in action. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you so much, Liz. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I want to link what Liz ended on uh, and ask Sophia um, a bit about the importance of coalition struggles and that overlap between feminism, queer rights, and anti-racism. Yeah, can answer that. That was a tough act to follow. Um, but yeah, I wanted to follow what Liz has said, uh, particularly around the need for internationalism and broad solidarity across communities, and to use my time today to reflect on the need for anti-racism, to connect to feminism, and queer activism in order to build our collective power. And the reason why I feel this is so urgent right now is because of what's going on around the world at a global level. At a time of increased authoritarianism, the far right is combining racism with attacks on reproductive rights and the demonization of anyone who does not subscribe to the heteronormative nuclear family. And this has resulted in a normalization of transphobia, racism, sexism, and homophobia. So now more than ever, we need to be building alliances between community organizing because our liberation is bound to one another's and our movements can't afford to be fragmented. And I've written about this in our journal, Race and Class, in an article on reproductive racism, where I've highlighted the underlying racism behind attacks on reproductive rights, looking particularly at family policies of the right, which are often driven by fears of a demographic takeover. But also how increasingly queer communities and especially trans people are also being presented as threats to the nation. This has resulted in a rising tide of homophobia and transphobia across Europe. We've seen neo-Nazis marching through Spanish neighborhoods during pride events, expressing contempt for migrants and LGBT people. And a couple of weeks ago, a trans man died following a brutal attack at a pride event in Germany after defending a group of women who were being harassed by homophobic threats. And here in the UK, we've seen drag queen story hours being targeted by far-right protesters across the country. And because attacks on reproductive rights, on LGBT rights, and the rights of migrants and refugees are increasingly linked, our solidarity must be broad and transnational. Far-right groups often borrow from each other. They copy each other's tactics. Therefore, what happens elsewhere, whether in Europe or the US, often has an impact here. 
And in these really urgent times, now more than ever, we need an inter intersectionality of struggles at an international level. And if that, this task is daunting, that's when reflecting on past struggles of solidarity can be really uplifting and empowering. And today's panel is called New Circuits of Anti-Racism, but I also think it's incredibly important to connect to old circuits as well. And for me, the black feminism movement in Britain offers many such examples and show how activists have long been fighting simultaneously against racism and sexism in this country. And one of the most horrific historical cases is the conduct of virginity testing by immigration officials on South Asian women that took place in the 1970s. Under immigration laws, women did not need a visa to join their fiancés in the UK, but upon arrival, they'd be subject to a, this form of sub, uh, sexual abuse in order to check if they were virgins, to prove their eligibility for a visa. But this was not left unresisted. Organized by a South Asian women's collective, OWAS, and the Organization of Women of African and Asian Descent, OAD, a powerful picket took place at Heathrow Air Airport to protest these virginity tests, as well as protests in India, which again shows global solidarity in practice. And the practice of virginity testing was eventually stopped, but it's important to recall this history of state-sanctioned sexual abuse and see its legacies. And if you were at the earlier pro uh, panel, we heard about the outrage following revelations about the strip searching of Child Q, another form of state-sanctioned sexual abuse, but this time at a school in Hackney. So it's al also important to remember that such violence will always be resisted on the ground. And one of the unifying slogans of the black feminist movement was many voices, one chant. And I think this can teach us a lot in the present day. We come with a multiplicity of voices and experiences, but together we can move in the same direction. And it's important to amplify such voices. And this is where the work of radical new media platforms are so important. And at the IRR, we um, have a platform called IRR News, which is an alternative media source where we publish analysis, interviews, and also a calendar of racism and resistance, which documents structural racism across, U across Europe. But also podcasts play a huge role in this as well. And this is where I'm really excited to hear from Chantal Lewis from Surviving Society, who will talk more about this. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, yes, maybe we can move on to Chantelle, and Chantelle okay. can tell us a bit about yeah. new knowledge production around anti-racism. I can't believe I've got to follow both of like that was incredible. <laughs> like I'm saying, like that was amazing. Thank you so much, listen, Sophia. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about surviving society, but I'm going to try and locate it within the politics of the things we're talking about now, and that being um, anti-racist solidarities, but in particular thinking about knowledge production. And even though I'm going to talk about knowledge production now, and what I mean by that is us creating spaces where we learn from each other um, through our differences, through our similarities, but also locating struggles in histories. So knowledge production being um, scholarship, basically, writing, reading, trying to bring the academy with outside, out going beyond the academy. So, sorry, by the way, I did a panel just now um, on Child Q, and it was really, it was, it was such an amazing um, panel, and it's such a great, great space, but it's taken out of me a little bit, and I have, I'm quite, um, I've got quite high function ADHD, so I, I need to just like settle my brain a little bit. So if I do um, stall a little bit, just give me a minute. So, Surviving Society. So we started Surviving Society um, because we wanted to talk a little bit about our PhD research um, as scholars and we also wanted to talk about the media and we saw that what we were learning in sociology, in politics at university that we could apply some of our theory, what people have done in the past obviously at IRR, to what was happening and the key things that were happening at the time in 2017 where we had the Grenfell Tower fire, we had Brexit, we had years of seven years of coalition government and it's not to say that anything we were doing anything that we were doing as in talking together as scholars about society and the media was revolutionary but it was more about sort of talking together learning together with broad coalitions of people that agree on most things but that actually sometimes disagree on some of the particulars of how we get to imagining a, fr a future where we're all much more free than we are now. So it wasn't necessarily, I don't think, anything revolutionary, but it was a space of learning together that was not necessarily using academic language or 
quote unquote big words to talk about politics. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, defending intellectualism, even though I've just said that um, in a minute. But um, I think that one of the thi- one of the one of the reasons why um, surviving society, I think, has been has has garnered a lot of listeners, and we're so we're so proud and pleased that that's happened, is because of it exists within the bro- a broad coalition of existing works that have been produced outside of the academy. So the issue that we have now with outputs like Surviving Society is they get positioned as something that are, that's unique or that's original. But if you listen to what me and Tiso actually talk about on the show, it's very much centred around de-individualising our project and scholarship, even though we have to lean into the marketing principles of doing podcasting. Um, if anything that I'm saying doesn't doesn't make sense or I'm being a bit jargony, please, when we come to the questions, ask me what I mean by this. But basically, w- what we've had is a, an academic podcast that has managed to be, quote-unquote, successful, um, but that also sometimes gets misused as something that I think we're, we're quite prone to doing on the left in terms of idealising certain ways of certain scholars, certain ways of doing things um, and and I'm very resistant to that but also want to make sure that people get the knowledge and scholarship and understandings um, that we produce in the academy outside of that. So it's very much it's very much a, a project of becoming it's very much a project that is um, something that plays into some of the neoliberal logics that I think are a problem on the left that we need to keep resisting. Um, but, yeah, so so I think that individualism, as Liz was saying, is something that, unfortunately, even though our politics says it shouldn't be that on the left, is something that continues to plague the left. And what I have to do as my very, very tiny, tiny role in um, producing knowledge production in a digital format is keep saying, yes, Thank you for supporting what we're doing. But it exists within so many different other um, means of producing knowledge and democratising information. And actually, it's a very, very small cog in um, movement building in term for, for liberation. And what I mean by that is you can't... Knowledge production doesn't replace direct action. Knowledge production doesn't replace being sat in a room. Knowledge production doesn't be replace being on the picket. It certainly helps it and supports it. But we have to just keep resisting. Even though something looks shiny and we have a nice logo and all that stuff, and we need that to get people engaged with the product, we need to keep resisting the politics around marketing products that are helping us get more information out there um because the reality is like if you look at liz spoke about the rise of the far right in europe if you look at like their digital resources like these are some of the biggest podcasts in the world now and they are literally funded by billionaires and they are producing extremely hateful transphobic racist misogynistic content and W- essentially, m- the way we market to survive in society, although we're not funded by the far right or anything like that, we're, so we're sometimes using similar principles to these these podcasts as well. And it's like, actually, like what what can how can we make our projects of continuing um, knowledge production that is outside of the academy, democratizing information, different to that of the far right? How can we make it different? And that is by saying, look, what we do is this, but go to these people, look at this Look at this other podcast, L- let's train someone else to um, produce this work, let's talk to other organisations, bring people in, like, we have to keep resistant individualism on the left, and I, I'm so, I'm sympathetic to it, because we are struggling right now, Plague Island is real, like, we are struggling, on the left, we don't have many people to look up to, so it means when you do see, like, these little like, things, like, things like Surviving Society, if you, when you do see things like this that do inspire you, it, it's it's easy to position it as a beacon, and really, what I want to, want it to be positioned as is a very small contribution to the wider politics of anti-racist solidarity. So I'm so grateful for people coming up to us even today, being like, "Thanks for all you do," and it's like, no, it's part of it's part of everyone. It's part of everything that we're trying to do together. And I think that yeah, these are there's there's, there's lots of we're all we're all um, we're all human beings, but I do think on the left when we're struggling in times of struggle, when there's l- little hope, we we have to make sure that we're constantly de-individualizing. We're constantly making sure that we're resisting um, celebrity culture. And I think, I know one more thing I'm going to say is that we are very much located in being a black radical podcast and, a, and one that is embedded in black scholarship and black radical thinking. 
And part of that has been because of the systemic exclusion of black scholars within the academy and outside of the academy and being taken seriously. So there are some aspects of us leaning into the fact that actually we are reclaiming some spaces, that that is an important part. And I think this comes back to thinking about struggles and solidarities and resistances within our movement. So even though I'm very much, my politics is about anti-racist solidarity, we do have to, and we talk about this on the, on the show a lot, talk about the exclusion of black scholars within these, in these spaces, talk about it, do something about it, then build together, I think is really important. Because to say that our exclusion is something that isn't of material reality is simply untrue. And I think that sometimes for people like myself and others that I know are in the room, particularly as black women, we want to create those bridges but we're constantly having to speak to our people and be like, no, honestly, they do care about us. I know sometimes they say this and like, they so don't always include us in this, but they do care, they do. Like, actually, if there was a politics of recognition of difference that is meaningful and politically engaged and engaged in the, the lived experiences as a starting point and moving on from that, then I think that we can get to that space of anti-racist solidarities that are a bit more that are generative, that are realistic, but that also take seriously why some people have issues with some of the some of the politics that happen within these movements. I'm happy to talk more about that, but equally, I think as I'm on this panel, it's very clear what my politics are, but I'm also very sympathetic to some of the issues that we've had within our um, broad coalitions. But I'm not, I'm in no way not, I'm, I'm very hopeful. I'm very much in a place of optimism, as, as Liz just said. I think there's so many incredible things that are happening right now. It's so amazing being in this space, like seeing people and hearing um, about all these different collectives. I'm so privileged that um, we get to produce Surviving Society together and to bring these people on the show to inspire us and to inspire the listeners. Um, so yeah, even though there's been sort of some critiques of the left um, in my talk, um, I am very much, I am very optimistic, um, but there is a lot of work to go, a lot of work to do, but I think, I think we're on the right, on the right road. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chantelle. That was wonderful. Um, if we can move on to Avsar, who um, may be able to outline some of those continuities in people of colour-led organising in Britain. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is that all right? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, thanks to... I have to read my notes because I can't freestyle for the life of me. Uh, so thanks to Liam for the invite. I'm genuinely honoured to be speaking alongside IR, like who I have enough respect for. Um, so you meant to be joined by my co-author, Ilyas Nagdi. Uh, he couldn't he drop out the last minute. Uh, so while I may be sort of the consolation prize, I hope I can make up for it uh, with the content. So, so as time is short, I'll quickly trace the development, sorry, the emergence. Yeah, sure, sorry. Close, is that better? Yeah. All right. Okay, so as time is short, I'll very quickly trace the emergence and decline of black power organizing in Britain during the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, the lessons it offered, lessons it offered the British left then and now and the importance of rebuilding radical uh, anti-racist institutions if we are to advance beyond what we've seen, the very large, very promising, very impressive mobilizations, and you know, translate that into a radical political project. Uh, so first part, black power. Uh, in Britain, black power emerged in the late 60s um, until the early 80s, as I period, periodized it, sorry, in response to the racist exclusion and ex exploitation of African, Asian, and Caribbean communities, hence one known as black, as is known at the time, people, um, at the hands of gun policy, racism in terms of popular street racism, as well as the racism of the British Labour movement, which was a major factor at the time, right? And still now. Um, so from their place on the edge of British society, African and Asian Caribbean people could develop communities of resistance uh, by organizing around the pillars of, I guess, free seas, uh, community, culture, and consciousness. So these are the three core ingredients of Black Power, in my opinion. The first being community, that means organizing within and among communities rather than, I guess, outsourcing activism to uh, white-led white institutions like the Labour Party or trade unions even which had long established, uh, so long exhibited a white chauvinism that had expressed itself in very ugly ways, including, for example, um, backing anti-migrant laws, obstructing strikes, even uh, strike breaking when they're led by black and Asian workers. Um, second is the question of organizing around culture, both in terms of organizing through cultural forms, you know, music, uh, arts, literature, and so on, and also in, in terms of being able to shape the political culture of their communities and therefore enabling um, what were often quite small organizations and groups and parties to project their politics further than others would allow based on their capacity. So again, commanding the political culture of a community and enables it to sort of yeah, have a boost to your politics as it were. And thirdly, the question of black power, uh, consciousness, consciousness of black power organizations. So they weren't cohesive or ideologically uniform by any means. Um, but black power was made coherent by a conscious awareness of the role of black people in British society, 
in the world and in the grand scheme of history, right? So, such that they weren't just reacting to racism, um, but had a sort of ideological orientation that sort of guided them and a project to work towards rather than a responsive, reactive form of activism. And so something that was fostered by the intellectual output of the IER, race and class, race theory collectives, and so on. So living in the shadow of exclusion from mainstream British politi no, mainstream political life, black communities in Britain were able to advance or develop innovative forms of organizing, which I think is important um, to our rebuilding the left today, right? So by avoiding the constraints of the Labour Party and the official trade union machinery, in many ways, uh, black power organi organizing sorry, was able to defy the illusory, bi illusory binary between uh, workplace or economic struggle on one hand and uh, political struggle on the other. So they merged them together. And, um, and they developed organizing which enabled them to radicalize individual social struggles into sharper political antagonisms, as is mentioned in uh, Sivananda's quote, of turning case into causes, causes into campaigns. So therefore they yeah, transform co campaigns into national causes, and they turn sort of what, you know, the nodes of, of social life, restaurants, social centers, bookshops, neighborhood strike committees, radical parties alike into nodes of a radical political network, thereby transforming these communities into organic communities of resistance against popular and state racism. Uh, so put simply, black power was not just opposition against racism. It was not a single issue, any racist struggle. It was struggles for community, struggles for self-determination, and struggles for social transformation. Its strength was being in its ability to amalgamate struggles against economic exploitation, social alienation, and democratic exclusion of racialized communities in Britain, while also art articulating a fierce anti-imperialist critique to situate their struggles within Britain in sort of wider um, coordinate of power, right? wider analysis of power um, internationally. So this was the intellectual contribution of black power in Britain, penetrating through the self-serving mythology of the British state, recognizing the inherent interconnection between capitalism, racism, and imperialism, as well as putting forward an analysis that post war social democracy in Britain, even as height of the welfare state, of Keynesianism, of the spirit of 45, was not just blemished by racism, but built on it, structured by it. Uh, second part, so what happened after that? Um, so in 1981, we saw the urban uprisings of predominantly African, Caribbean, um, and Asian youth sparked first in Brixton in April, and then across the country in summer. Uh, and, and this was sparked in the context of the racist sus laws, um, the passage of the British Nationality Act, uh, unemployment, recession, and sort of the growth of far-right attacks on the Thatcher's first government. So in the aftermath of the, of the um, uprisings in 81, we saw the Thatcher government, and then the Thatcher, no, so the government initiated inquiry with Lord Scarman into Brixton, and the approach of the Labour left councils at the time helped to contain and absorb the radical potential of black power through various interlocking sort of strategies. So as we are outlined in our book, a uh, very short summary, uh, it raises the bottom, these played out along a three-pronged strategy. First was a uh, question of like, um, black enterprise, the black-run enterprise. So redefining a political problem of racism into simply an uh, issue of commerce alone, and seeking to develop a layer of non-white entrepreneurs to emerge as the new sort of leaders of black major communities. Second was the question. Yes. All right, all right, all right. Oh God, all right, all right. Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 right. No, I'll start from this top of section a bit, uh, just to catch up. Sorry, I'm a Londoner. That's my excuse. Um, so in 1981, we saw the urban uprisings of predominantly African, Asian, and Caribbean youth, uh, sparked in the context of the racist sus laws, uh, stop and search powers, the passage of the British Nationality Act, unemployment, recession, and uh, the growth of far right attacks under the Thatcher's first government. So in the aftermath of uh, the Thatcher government, the government initiated inquiry um, by Lord Scarman into the into uprisings, as well as the approach of the Labour left, um, Labour left run councils at the time, helped contain and absorb the radical potential of black power. So this happened along sort of three uh, interlocking strategies, as it were. Uh, one is the question of black enterprise, uh, so redefining a political problem of racism into one of simply commerce alone. Secondly, was the question of uh, what we term uh, like recognition politics. Um, so seeking recognition and validation within institutions of the British state rather than sort of in contradiction to against them or conflict with them. And that flowed directly into the phenomenon of what we know, know today as representation politics, blackface and half place and so on like that. And in the process, these communities of resistance were turned to flat constituencies to be represented by some MP here and there, a council here and there, or some organization that could speak on behalf of these communities without actually engaging in the struggle that they uh, were uh, subject to. And thirdly is the growth of civil society, so promoting the growth of non-profits and charities, often funded by local and national government, and fostering the growth of a national, uh, sorry, a race relations machinery, which is geared more towards offering policy prescriptions rather than building power, and often serving as a conveyor belt uh, towards political office with the Labour Party somewhere down the line. So in sum, this transformed the terms of engagement and the relationship to political power. So instead of black power, we had uh, black civic power, organized with NGOs and um, 
nonprofits. It says Black Power. We have sort of attempts at building a black corporate power, so sort of lobby politics or the emergence of. And instead of Black Power, we had Black Cooperation with Power, sort of more advisory role, a sort of soft, softly touch approach, rather than uh, confrontation with the state and it's m m many ways in which to reproduce racism uh, structurally. So these would culminate in what we now know as state multiculturalism, which I, I think had high tide was in uh, probably the election of the New Labour government in 97, and then it crashed down about a decade after that. Uh, and sort of mirrored the growth of neoliberalism as it was emerging at the time, same time under the Thatcher government. So effectively, this was Thatcher's other legacy, right? Undermining, uh, defanging, containing black power organizing in Britain. And uh, yeah. So through this new arrangement, the organic link between community culture and consciousness was broken. Uh, political work was outsourced to the lay party. Practical work was absorbed within the realm of NGOs and nonprofits. And cultural work was stripped of its political substance and turned into what we know, I guess, the pageantry of like uh, multiculturalism, I mean, often expressed in the phrase, um, you know, saris, samosas, little pans, right? It's no longer about political culture, it's about just representing some facet of your identity, hoping that would somewhat um, gain acceptance, right? In society. So the, yeah, finally, the ability of these communities of resistance to reproduce themselves was broken, and radical organizations were largely suffocated out of resistance by struggles about funding, corruption, repression, or straight up burnout. Um, without the ability to organize communities in defense of themselves and their livelihoods, anti-racism, quote unquote, itself became outsourced to organs and institutions of the, of the racist state, through the police, through the like, Equality Human Rights Commission, and God forbid, even the lay party. Um, as they withered away, the ugly politics of ethnic divisions and opportunism, individualism, everything that's mentioned on the panel today, sort of reared the head, right? They emerged to fill the gap that had once been um, occupied by radical political organizing. Um, and to be clear, the point is not that black power, as of 1981 or any point, any point before that, sorry, uh, was like a perfectly constituted, perfectly formed movement ready to seize straight Pacific power. I don't believe that's ever the case. But the strategy, what I did post at you on, was disarm our communities of the means to re refine and build that movement into something that you know we could um, be proud of. And lastly, conclusion. Um, I think I'm going a bit long, so I'll skip a bit. Where are we now? So politics is nothing without organization. It is organizations which provide the capacity for harnessing upsurges, like we saw in 2020, into a sustained action. It is organizations which act as nodes for cultivating and ex exercising um, material solidarity. And it's organizations alone which can bridge the experience between experiences of racism to sort of revolutionary consciousness around its, um, its solutions. So in other words, anti-racism is not just vibes, it must be organized, right? And I think Liz has spoken about the slow, I guess, uh, promising development, organizations, organizational forms in the last couple of years. I think we should definitely uh, you know, cherish them, build upon them, advance them, uh, bring them into organizing. And not, I think as the left sometimes, has a left sometimes has a tendency to do, to ignore anything that isn't a Labour Party, a COP, or a trade union. I think the other forms of organizing are often invisibilized. We need to bring them back to the fore and see how they can work, advance, or support um, uh, radical politics, right? Uh, yeah, so what did Black Power offer us? The powerful analysis of Black Power which integrated an analysis of race, class, and imperialism. Oh, okay, all right. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'll try. It's the last few lines, so that's such a better. I can hear it. The powerful analysis of black power, which integrated analysis of race, class, and citizenship, is as needed now as much as ever, especially given the very tired debates on race versus class we often hear, some are being recycled from decades ago uh, today. And with a trade union movement slowly rebuilding itself, the black power critique of British trade unionism and its ingrained blind spots on race and imperialism is vital now if we are to escape the historical failings of the British labor movement. Um, yeah, and the innovative forms of organizing for which black power groups were able to develop communities of resistance is again essential today at a time when encounters with state violence and with fuel poverty with slum lords can just as easily be radicalizing experiences towards socialism as, as, as much as they are sort of marks of wretched society. So again, our political programs cannot start or end on the shop floor or the ballot box or with the COP. Um, for the socialist left, a bold socialist vision uh, must include reinserting the um, struggles against capitalism within a liberatory anti-racist framework rather than retreating to its own comfort zone of postal welfareism and sort of the mythology around that. Uh, this must be a socialism which speaks, w speaks of the working class in its totality, uh, which reintegrates the manifold struggles against racism and the state into radical political program. And ultimately, it's only through imbuing class struggle with the politics of anti-racism, past and present, and anti-imperialism that we can develop a truly transformative project. Sorry for the noise, I've ended now. Thanks for listening.
Thank you, Avsar, for a whistle-stop tour through post-war organising and anti-racist spaces. Um, I'm going to just ask uh, uh, the panel uh, a number of individual questions, and then we will open it up to a Q&A for the audience. Um, Liz, if I can start with you. Um, y you touch upon the importance of a true internationalism. Um, how can anti-racist struggles practically work together across borders in an era of rising nationalism? So, how can anti-racist struggles learn from each other and inform each other's work across borders? Um, can I have about an hour to think about <laughs> that? <laughs> I think they're already doing it. I mean, I think um, I think on a European level they're already doing it. Um, I mean, there's so many networks, you know, No Borders, um, you know, even the you know the NGO world. They're all working together across borders. I think that also there is a lot of understanding of the similarities between what's happening in the US and Central America and what's happening um, in other parts of the world, in Africa, in Israel. And so I think it's already happening, but I think the second part of your question is actually the, the more difficult question in terms of the rising nationalism, because I think I've seen here, in a way, in a way since Brexit, in a funny sort of way, that we're becoming more inward looking and we're becoming less aware of what's happening in even other European countries. And, I mean, in the sort of first presentation, I talked about the dangers of Eurocentrism. And actually, I didn't actually want to talk about the Russian aggression in Ukraine. But the one thing that has struck me from the start of this war is that most of us didn't know anything about Ukraine. We weren't aware that there was already a war taking place in the Ukraine before the war started. And in a sense, that has been part of our Eurocentrism as well, in the sense that Europe has always been Western Europe and Northern Europe. And I think that all these tendencies for us to not understand not just what's happening in other parts of the world, which are Europe, but actually not understand what is happening in Europe, and actually not understanding the dangers of the nationalism in Central Europe and Eastern Europe as well. Um, so that because we're facing Russian aggression and Russian imperialism undoubtedly, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be aware that there are very dangerous nationalisms in the Baltic states, in Poland, which are actually exploiting this crisis for their own rebirth and renaissance. And we've got to catch up really, really quickly because I'll tell you one thing, the Conservative Party, why are we giving how many billions of pounds of, of uh, aid to the Ukraine for arms? Do you think Liz Truss and Boris Johnson are giving it because they're anti-fascists? I don't think so. But the Conservatives were sitting in the European Parliament with, they left the main Conservative group in the European Parliament and were sitting with the nationalists from the Baltic states and from Poland. And these... Uh, there is a very, very dangerous nationalism there that is going to impact on Eurocentrism in, in, a, in a very worrying way. So the second part of your question, I think, is the real challenge to us. The border activism is already happening, but the fact is that we do not understand the various nationalisms of Europe well enough at the moment. Oh, it took me a long time. Fantastic. To <laughs> I wanted to move on to Sophia. Sophia, you talk a lot about the overlap between the feminist struggle and the anti-racist struggle and the LGBTQ struggle. 
You've also written in Race and Class around the kind of essential work that migrant women do in terms of care, which may limit their capacity to be on the front line of these struggles at a time when their rights as citizens are being taken away from the state. How does one balance the idea of essentially being a target for the state and having to live your lives day to day, whilst also um, kind of having to do uh, yeah, essential work at a time where you're being marginalised as a citizen and a worker? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. Um, cause yeah, as you mentioned, like a really central part of my work is looking at the struggles of migrant workers, particularly migrant women who are doing the care work that keeps societies running at the same time while being constantly excluded um, from society and pushed to the margins of society. But in answer to your question, I'd say that I think migrant women are at the, the center of struggle, um, particularly domestic workers who um, are some of the most invisibilized people um, who often don't have any rights because they work in a private home, which are spaces without rights, which is something that the PPT, the P Permanent People's Tribunal, drew, drew attention to. Um, and despite the fact that they're living in such a precarious situation, they're on the front lines campaigning for their rights and also like the rights of all migrant workers as a whole. Um, and I, th I draw like endless inspiration from their struggles because they're in some of the most precarious positions. In, in building that, in, in terms of, of one's activism and one's experience, I know that, um, that Chantelle, you're uh, invested in creating kind of new um, areas of knowledge production. But there are also risks, I suppose, in the democratization of, of knowledge. And we talked earlier about this, you know, it's not just uh, broad progressive movements that benefit from from knowledge being spread around. It's also a kind of boon on the far right. And I was just wondering if you can outline some of those, uh, you know, risks about uh, knowledge production being democratized. Yeah, I think um, I think in answering this question, I definitely draw inspiration from Bell Hooks, who actually would have been seventy yesterday. Um, in the as in the defense of intellectualism and in the defense of facts and knowledge and what bell hooks i think was implying here or talking about in particular concerning the academy and um scholarship is that we we don't want to take ourselves too seriously as scholars but we also do want to take ourselves seriously in terms of the research and content and knowledge production that we generate because it's ba not just based on anecdotal reflections it's based on rigor it's based on yeah things that are that are not just how we feel about a situation even though how we feel about a situation definitely can inform how we see our, how we see our uh, political position in society all this being said it, it is such an exciting time um, in terms of the access that we have um, as individuals to get more um, learning resources when it comes to thinking about anti-racism, for example, when it thinks that comes to thinking about what we teach in the academy or what lecturers teach in the academy is so much more accessible now, more so than ever. However, we also, as I uh, was talking about earlier, have a situation where different forms of knowledge production that are engineered to create division that are embedded in hate, that are embedded in transphobia, that are embedded in racism, are highly, highly linked to capitalism. And obviously what I mean by that is that there is so much money in producing hateful content now. And that b wh what that means is we're getting even more forms of knowledge production that are not embedded in um, thinking about um, emancipatory futures. They're embedded in intensifying no intensifying feelings of exclusion and what i mean by that is thinking about um the the manosphere thinking about how easy or how democratized an idea the idea of the man um being one of the be, being the person that's 
being excluded and the most in society right now. There's so much money behind the, these types of resources, that these not resources, sorry, these types of um, these types of knowledge productions that are embedded in hate that are funded. So I think that the risk is, and then at the same time, we also have people that are not necessarily um, thinking about. Um, not necessarily thinking about reproducing hateful content, but are simply feeling very disenfranchised and alienated by their material condition. And what we have seen, um, and it's a multi-ethnic, multi-class issue. I, I mean, I can't believe how many middle-class white people I've soon turned to conspiracy theorists now. These mums net people are mad. Anyway, right. <laughs> what I mean by that is that, like, there is, the, the, particularly in the last few years, like, the... Conspira conspiracy theories, like, it's, it is such an issue, like, particularly, like, uh, particularly of those, <coughs> those people that are literally have nothing, and I can, I can totally sympathise and empathise with why that is happening, because we are in a situation where those in power are, are able to harness, actually, like, you've got people like Boris Johnson, when he was in office, like, utilising these, like, utilising threads of conspiracy <coughs> to divide people, and to create, yeah, an, a, a society where I'm sat with like uncles and aunties and I've got to talk to them about how they feel about a situation being much more important than those in power controlling um, the means of production, controlling what we, what we have as a people, controlling our material conditions. Like, anecdotal reflections are really important, I think. I don't want to take that away. And they're how we create generative conversations. They're how we create understanding. They're how we bridge lines between difference and, sim difference and similarities. But they can only be the starting point. We have to defend intellectualism. We have to defend facts. We have to defend knowledge. And I think, I think Liz is right as well. Liz is talking about the kind of like Brexit moment as being a moment for us to turn it in the, on each other. And I know it's been said time and time again, particularly in these particular spaces, but when Michael Gove says uh, people are tired of experts, like we can't underestimate as a people, particularly on the left, how much that has infiltrated mm -hmm. those that we're in community with. And, um, and it's a, such a difficult conversation to have um, because I'm still trying to work out what it looks like. Um, and it's harder to look for, to understand what it looks like to understand why that's happening because we are, are in a dire, dire situation in terms of, yeah, our material conditions. As Khadija said earlier to me, the war on the poor. Like, it is, it is such a difficult situation, I think. Um, but ultimately, I, I am comforted by the democratisation of knowledge and the accessibility that we all have to resources that can help us understand our material conditions. But I remain concerned with how it is misused or funded by, yeah, the right. I'd, I'd like to hear, as far, build upon Chantelle's points and talk about the kind of practical ways that people can build communities of resistance on the ground, away from the limits of social media, mainstream media discourse around race. How do you get people from shouting into at the moon about race online, or being angry at the traditional media's coverage of race and get them to build those communities of resistance practically on the ground. Um, so when, Nelly, go on, louder, is that all right? So me and Elias, when we were writing the book, uh, discussed this question of social media, uh, we had it back and forth and it came into the book. Um, Ultimately, we're quite ambivalent on the role of social media that it can, uh, the role of social media can play in terms of organizing. We came to the conclusion that ultimately, while it is a valuable tool, a communicative tool, it cannot replace uh, the work of the work that organization organizations should take. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, I said that aside. I think social media again. Social media has a role. We can't deny the role it's played. But I think if we expect to sort of offload all the organizing work on social media and social media being the forms for which to communicate, we can establish a presence on the ground, presence within our communities. We've already lost the fight, in my opinion. I think the question we discussed is that, um, as I mentioned, the communities of resistance, communities of resistance in, in the 70s and 80s were built up by sort of amalgamating and coalescing all these various um, fronts of social struggle into sort of uh, a more wide-ranging Atlantis of power and more wide-ranging pol um, politics. Sorry. Um, for example, in London, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the London, London Renters Union. I think these are sort of uh, uh, acorns doing good work up in the north too, in Manchester and I think Liverpool. 
I think these sort of new organization forms are sort of, again, key nodes, as, as Liz is talking about, for which we rebuild a sort of culture of, of solidarity, a culture of struggle. And I think, again, if we, we sort of move away with a very um, hackneyed view, as if social struggle only ever occurs in individual workplaces or, again, at the political realm of national politics. I think the key point is that how do you identify the forms where social struggle are happening, state violence, one, police violence, immigration, border po politics, and so on, and sort of find a way in which you can bring this together and find ways in which you can, uh, organization forms we can accommodate and nurture solidarity as like a, a practical exercise as a politics rather than just as a sort of transactional uh, exercise in solidarity, right? I give it to you, give it to me, we give it to you, yeah, we give it to you. I think finally, yeah, the question of social media, I think I'll leave it up in the air. I think people have different views on that. I don't want to sort of get too polemic about that. It has a role to play. But fundamentally, what we are lacking, what we have been lacking for so long, is organizations, practical organizations, whether that be the party form, the pre-party form, other forms of radical organizations and institutions. I think those are the only means for which we can, again, uh, conglomerate all these multiple struggles together in actual politics, which we can advance so going forward and incubate forms of solidarity, which is generative, which, which are radical, which can uh, take the fight forward. Yeah, I'll leave it there quite generic, but I hope that helps. Uh, if I could just add something to what Chantal and Aspa have said, as somebody who was active in the early 1980s, and you made the point that we mustn't romanticise that period, I think we did have very strong organisation. Um, we did have a, a concept of collectivity. Um, there was individualism undoubtedly but there was also a suppression of the individual and the individual conscience i think you know some of us who are older will say you know there i mean we talk about it at the office with sophia i mean you just thought you get up in the morning you go for the struggle and you go to bed at night and that was your life you know um occasionally you do the washing up but you know, there, there was a sacrifice of the individual. And what I like about the organisational modes today is the caring that people give to each other. And it's, you know, I mean, I, I have a daughter who's, you know, a little bit younger than Sophia, but she's just grown up in a much more different culture at school where people really do care about each other. And that, that we see in our organisational models today, but it's not seen in social media. And I think that if we are abolitionists, we have got to say that social media has become a very punitive place for the individual. That people are punished for making mistakes. The sense that they can be educated and they can learn, they can make a mistake, but you know, you can learn. You don't have to be, you know, cancelled um, to, to use a, you know, a word that is often banded around perhaps too much. But you know, we've got to stop social media as a place of punishment of the individual and really grab its vital, vital capacity it gives us as an organisational source. And a final question from me before we open it up uh, to an audience Q&A. What we've heard from, from all of your responses is the importance of learning from history adapting anti-racist struggles. My question, and anyone can answer this, is how does one adapt our anti-racist struggles when those at the front line are considered threats to the nation by the state, by the media? So these are people holding up police work by doing anti-raids work. People who are, you know, outsiders, migrants coming in even LGBTQ people who are seen as a threat to the kind of moral fibre of the nation. How does one ensure that those at the front line are not taken in by state and media narrative and kind of suppressed in their essential anti-racist work? Um, yeah, I think that's like such an urgent quest question to take on right now. Um, and I would say for me, especially seeing mobilizations around Kill the Bill, like in the past year, have been really inspiring. And I think that's shown what coalitional work looks like on a practical level. Because um, the thing is about that police bill, it targets so many of us. It targets protesters, climate activists, feminists, 
um, BLM protesters, Gypsy Roma travelers. It literally targets like everyone. Um, and in a weird way, that's kind of brought people together in solidarity to resist it. Um, so I think it's really important in terms of learning, the pa uh, learning from the past and responding in the present day, um, building on these moments of solidarity where we can see that our struggles are shared. Um, something might affect some of us more than other people, but then that's still a reason for us all to be coming together. Um, and I've also been really inspired by, as you mentioned, the anti-raids work. Um, and here we can really see uh, like the power of social media of bringing people together on the ground. Because what we were seeing is that people would send out a tweet that there's an immigration raid going on, whether that's in Dalston or Peckham or Manchester, in Glasgow. And what happened is that you know so many people in the community were galvanized. People who weren't necessarily political before were coming out and saying, no, you're not going to deport my neighbor. And I think that's like, so incredibly powerful and we need to build on that. And then the final point I wanted to make was around um, what you all mentioned before, which is that we're not necessarily born an anti-racist or an abolitionist. We don't just you know, come out and have these politics. It's a process of becoming, it's a process of learning, can be a process of unlearning as well. And I think we need you know, patience with each other and a willingness to learn from each other and learn with each other. And I think that's, the w that's why a political education is so important. And when I look back at archives, I see that that work was always so important. It wasn't just you know, going straight ahead and fighting the state, but it was actually coming together, reading together, you know, struggling together, asking those difficult questions. Um, and actually, that's the basis of learning together and then going on to fight um, on the streets against the state. I don't know. I'm definitely on some government list, so I don't like. I, I don't even know. I don't really have an answer to this. Like they're going to be coming for all of us. Um, is it is it Afua Hirsch got banned from the House of Lords recently? I don't really have an answer to it. I I think that yeah, if you're doing anti-racist work publicly, if you're being a publicly critical scholar, then yeah, you're on the list. That's that's, that's it. Uh, and Liz, how how does that link with with the the way that the new right framed things in like the 1980s that trade unionists were holding up the nation's productivity and you know left lefty councils were polluting the minds of young people? Oh, there's nothing new on the new right. <laughs> you know, there's nothing new. I mean, all the anti woke stuff is a, a regurgitation of the campaign the new right campaigns in the 1980s i mean the institute um was when it's on sale over there i believe on that store you can you may be able to get a hold of a copy of a cartoon book if there are any left which was actually a double page spread in the daily mail um saying that the broadwater farm riot started because the kids were you know reading this cartoon book and they just decided to to go out and riot against the police so we all through went back through that in the 1980s so you know just as i said you know we survived it so it can be survived over again the question i thought you were going to ask is is how does the did the irr survive <laughs> um oh, I like this yeah, I thought you were going to ask me that, how to read that, and it's a really, really important question because, you know, I don't like to call ourselves an NGO, I've never sort of saw, saw, saw it like that, partly because when, you know, when I started working there, you know, you got up at five o'clock in the morning and you got home at 12 o'clock and, you know what I mean, it was, you, you thought you were part of a political movement, you, you thought, you know, that was, that was your life, that's how you decided to live your life. But the point is that too many groups who are funded, and we are funded, we are lucky to be funded, but we don't take money from the state, and we are looking for, for extra help this year with our funds, but too many of the groups that are funded fall into the trap of being scared and censoring themselves. So you've got to be, you're always, you know, you've got to be on the sea boy, as you say. You've got to be on the tiptoes of your sensibilities. You know, oh, we were running home on the tiptoes of our sensibilities. Because, you know, you've got to be responsible as well. You want to carry on this organisation for 50 years. You can't be adventurous or you'll be closed down. But you can't censor yourself. So that is the nature of the 
you know, the burden of continuation because we survived 50 years, we have got an archive, we've got those materials that Sophia and other people who want to learn from the past can, can take. But, you know, if you're going to just be, you know, put everything flat out, you're not going to survive. Um, final words from uh, Asfar? Should we be questioning us? Can yeah, should we, should we open it up to... Yeah, you can question that. Okay, no, it, it was just essentially saying that um, how does one do practical work when the people at the front line are considered threats to the nation? Um, okay, I mean, hopefully, so in terms of work, our f some of our work involves a uh, question of counterterrorism and national security. So by definition, the people at the end of national security policies are deemed you know, enemies of the state and so on. I think taking back the question to question organization, how you organize and what language you use and sort of the forms in which we um, make our appeals to justice, I think, again, the NGO organization obviously seems to be the problem, but what flows out of that is a sort of um, some uncritical reliance on the justice system as a sort of means to advance justice and not seeing it as a sight of power, but rather seeing it as a sight in, oh, as a, on its own terms, which I believe that justice system is a neutral space in which you can make your claims upon them, help you get justice in return. I think that in itself often leads towards making these um, somewhat unprincipled appeals that certain cases are deemed more worthy <coughs> of, of justice or more worthy of campaigning around than others. It means self-centering, it means, yeah, I think um, fundamentally, if we recognize that the justice system we have now is so thoroughly compromised, so thoroughly embedded to and in, 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 in the intertwined with questions of state power, state violence, and so on, state brutality, we sort of move away from the idea that we can um, moderate our appeals based on the acceptance of justice and equality and fairness that we've been allotted and find new ways of organizing, uh, of building solidarity, including that means building solidarity with the unpopular cases, unpopular causes, unpopular individuals, and not sort of falling back on the idea of, you know, the good migrant, bad migrant, the, the good Muslim, bad Muslim, the good this, good that. I think in terms of the way that abolitionist organizing has advanced um, ideas around this and sort of, ref it's fine, and sort of um, refuse to go along with the land of um, uh, innocence, I think is important. I think, again, what we have now is sort of a, a congealed uh, history weighing upon us. And I think to break out of that, we need to, again, go back to first principles and identify what is a justice in the eyes, in the minds, uh, of the language of a socialist. How do you advance that going forward and how do you avoid falling into pitfalls? of you know, adopting the discourse set for us by the state and institutions. And um, yeah, thank you. Great.